All right, church, you know the drill. We want to invite you to come back to where you were seated and please stand up with us for the reading of God's word. Come on back and join us in standing. We got Bibles all the way in the back on the back table. This passage is going to be up on the screen right now, and then afterwards we encourage you to to follow along with us throughout the sermon in your own Bibles. This is John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42, as we continue in the Gospel of John. This is the word of the Lord, John 10, 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to who the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. This is the word of the Lord. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, church, it's good to be together. It's good to gather again. Uh, We're continuing on, obviously, the gospel of John, but uh, I just want to start with this just so we know exactly where we're going, what we're going to be unpacking, and where the Lord's inviting us today. Sometimes when we open God's word, we open it to information. Sometimes we open it to narrative. Sometimes we open it to poetry. There's all sorts of different things that we find in scripture. And yet today, my prayer is that you would see loud and clear that this passage is a declaration and an invitation. And here's what this passage is declaring and here's what it's inviting us into. I just want to start with this so you know exactly where we're going. Life comes to those that receive Jesus' words and believe Jesus' works. Life, true life, eternal life, abundant life that Jesus was talking about a few chapters ago, actually just in this chapter earlier, life comes to those that receive Jesus' words and then believe in Jesus' works. That's a a pretty big declaration. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know how you come to church this morning. I don't know where you're at as you're processing faith, or if you have faith, where you're at in the midst of your Christian journey. But I want to take time for us to pray, because I can say this, but this morning isn't about me saying anything. We rest on the authority of Scripture at Gospel Life. Amen? You got to hear from Jesus today. You don't need to hear from me. And I want to take a second for us to pray. And this isn't a prayer that the pastor's going to pray and you're just going to say, okay, pastor, thanks for praying. Great job filling space. I want to invite you to pray. Take a second to ask that the Lord would help you believe that. Because nothing I can say, nothing I can do can convince any of us of what's true and being declared. But we have an invitation from our Father to believe this by way of his son today. So I'm going to pray for us and I want to invite you to pray with me. Maybe own this personally and then we'll dive right into the text. Is that okay? Not in the notes, but we're doing it anyways. And I heard one person say, okay. So that's the okay. We're going to do it. (laughs) Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you, 
wake us up to the declaration that you're making in this passage today about Jesus being the life, about Jesus declaring that he is like nobody else, and wake us up to Jesus and the things that he's done for us. Lord, we just come to you admitting that we're distractible, we're fickle, we wander, and yet today we want to respond to your invitation. So we lay everything else aside, help us to focus, and more so, would you tune our hearts to hear your voice and then respond with thankfulness and joy and freedom in Jesus. Pray this in your name, amen. Amen, thanks for joining me for that. All right, before we dive into unpacking the rest of this passage, there's a lot here. A lot being declared, a lot being invited into. There is some historical stuff that we got to unpack because it talks about it right at the start in John 10, 22. We got to geek out for a second, do a little bit of a history lesson to set the stage, set the scene, and then we'll get into Jesus' words. And there's incredible stuff here for us to see there. But as we get started, verse 22 starts like this. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. Anybody know what the Feast of Dedication is? Anybody? It's Hanukkah. Whoa, interesting. That's what I thought when I read this. I grew up in a Christian church. I grew up in a Christian family. And whenever I hear Hanukkah, I think, okay, that's a Jewish tradition. I don't really have anything to do with that. We don't really celebrate that. At Christmas, we have baby Jesus in a cradle. We don't have a menorah. Like, what, what does this mean? And why is this here? Let's understand we got to recognize that there is something really significant about John, the author of this passage, saying that the Feast of Dedication is taking place and it's winter because it gives us a time stamp to when this is in the gospel account and where Jesus is going. We're about four to five months away from the cross. But before that, there's something significant in the Israelites' history that is really beautiful for us to recognize that Jesus celebrated and the Apostle John celebrated. In between the last book of the Old Testament and the first book of your New Testament is about 400 years of undocumented history in the Bible. The last prophet Malachi and then the arrival of John the Baptist, in between those, there's 400 years from the close of the old to the beginning of the new. This is called the intertestamental period, but it's also called the 400 years of silence. Do you know why? We see all throughout the Old Testament and Israelites' history that they would make promises to God of being faithful and then they'd fall flat on their face and fail in their sin and there was implication and consequence for their sin. The Israelites once again have turned away from God, worshiping false gods, and God withdraws his presence for a time, for a time. And over those 400 years of silence, they'd look to the skies and cry out and nothing. They would look for a prophet to come to bring God's word to them, and nothing. 400 years of silence. And during this period, in 168 BC, a Greek king comes into Jerusalem and overthrows it. Now, if you know anything about the Israelites, you know that they have had a tough go. When they sin, they rebel. Oftentimes, invaders come in and they ransack and they take the Israelites captive. But this time, instead of taking the Israelites away from Jerusalem, this king comes in and he subjugates them there. He ransacks their city. He makes them slaves and property there, different than in the past, but still it's oppression, it's persecution. And something happens when this king comes into town in 168 BC. He enters into the temple. God's place, his dwelling place, where his people would come and worship him. This king goes into the temple. He sets up a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies behind the the curtain, and he sacrifices a pig on the altar to the false god Zeus. Think about being an Israelite, and this is like your place. This is the sacred place that's been set aside to worship God, and a foreign invader comes in, sets up a statue of Zeus, sacrifices a pig, and says, you worship Zeus now. He burned copies of the Old Testament wherever he could find them, this king. He required Jews to make sacrifices to pagan gods in the temple, and he prohibited Jews from keeping the Sabbath or circumcising their children. The Jewish people had experienced persecution like this before, but not like this in Jerusalem. This is worse. It's close. It's intimate. Their own city has been overrun. And in the midst of this, something amazing happens. There's a man by the name Judah Maccabee, who gets his family together, and he starts to lead a rebellion against these Greeks. You guys like Star Wars? The rise of the resistance? You like it? This is way better. This is the people of God. 
And this guy with his family and these fellow Israelites, they start to lead a resistance force against what's happening. And in four years, in 164, they recapture Jerusalem and they take back the temple. It's awesome. It's epic. When they go into the temple, as they're entering back in, they realize it's ransacked. And yet they see a candle that has three leaves on one side and three leaves on the other. Looks like a menorah. That's what we'd call menorahs. It's a temple, or it's a, a temple candle that they've always had. They see it. And then they see this jar of oil. It wasn't a lot of oil, but it was enough to light the candle with. So they light the candle. And even though there was only enough oil to have the candle last for one day, do you know how long that candle burned for? Eight days. And they saw it as the supernatural sign of God's presence again with them. God's promises to them. That even in the midst of persecution and failure and abandonment and being crippled, that God had not yet left. So they created something called the Feast of Dedication when they rededicated the temple. The Festival of Lights, Hanukkah. Interesting, isn't it? John wants us to know that the Apostle John celebrated it. Most likely, Jesus is celebrating it. And this is a significant moment that's honored in the people of God's history. Even though it's not one of the original seven feasts, it was significant enough to mention. And when we see Hanukkah, we can celebrate something about what that declares about God's promises and presence now ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Amen? That's cool, isn't it? You didn't know that you were going to learn about Hanukkah this morning. It's great. I didn't know either when I was reading this. I'm like, we got to talk about this. This is great. So at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place. That's what's happening in Jerusalem. And it was winter. Hanukkah happens end of November, early December, kind of depending on the year. Jesus was killed during Passover, which means from November, December to April. We're about four to five months away from the cross. We're making our way there slowly. It was winter. And then verse 23 and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. I'm going to bring up two pictures for you to help set the scene a little bit more before we get to Jesus' words. This is a picture of the temple. You got the temple in the middle and then the outer walls, the, gent of the, court, or the court of the Gentiles, rather, around. That's kind of the empty space there. And you have this, uh, the colonnade of Solomon or Solomon's porch around where those pillars are. On this side, where that big ravine is, that's to the east. Behind it is the city. And Jesus is walking among those pillars. Now, we don't have this temple here today. It doesn't exist. It's been destroyed. But Jesus is walking along those pillars. Take a look at this other picture. This is painted by a guy in France named James Tussaud, James Tussaud in 1890. And this is his interpretation of this scene. Jesus is walking among the pillars. And you see how the crowds are around him. Oftentimes when we see this, we think, okay, like the crowds are gathering. It says, verse 24, the Jews gathered around him and started to talk to him. But we want you and I want you to see something significant. When it says that they're gathering around him, I want you to look at the guy to the left, kind of with a yellow robe or yellow thing over his head. He's got a hand to his mouth. Does he look happy or angry? Angry. Angry. When it says that the Jews gathered around Jesus as he's walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon, it's not talking about like gathering, coming close, hoping to hear the way that people listened in the north when Jesus was walking around Galilee. When he was with the crowds, the Samaritans, the outsiders from Jerusalem, people flocked because they were hungry. This is a different type of gather. The Greek word gathered here is a military term. It's not gather with interest. It's gather to circle Encircle or surround. They're circling him to surround him and trap him. You ever watch Shark Week? Shark Week fans in the house? Anybody? You're swimming in the ocean. Sharks start circling. Do they want a pool party? Are they wanting to snuggle? No. They're plotting their next move. They're circling and they're surrounding because they're looking to attack. And that's what these Jews were doing here. Their intent and their motive was not good. And that helps us understand the context of what they say next. 24, the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, we have to know context to know what they're actually saying. Is, are they saying, we've been sitting on the edge of our seat, Jesus, and we're just so glad you're here. Tell us everything you've done and tell us who you are. We can't wait to listen. It's not at all what they're saying. The phrase in the Greek literally means, how long are you going to annoy us, Jesus? 
In the Greek today, the Greek language today, the phrase means, how long will you take our lives away, Jesus? They're saying, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Your figures of speech and your metaphors and all this stuff about good shepherd, it's kind of annoying. You're not giving us enough evidence to put you in prison, and we need more. So they're on the attack. They're looking to corner him. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. It's really important for us to understand that to know what comes next. Did you know that Jesus hadn't yet told this Jewish audience that he was the Christ? Did you know that? When you think about Jesus interacting with people, there's one person so far in the Gospel of John that he said that he's the Christ to. Do you know who it was? Samaritan woman, an outsider, a broken woman, crushed by the shame of her sin. And he comes to her and he says, I'm the Messiah. I'm the sent one. He confirms and celebrates and declares to her in the midst of her brokenness and sin who he is, and it's beautiful. But he doesn't yet do that to the Jewish audience, although he will eventually. Do you know why? Because the second he says it, they kill him the very next day. Mark 14, 61. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Same question that they're asking here. And here Jesus says, he answers, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. When he announces that he's the Christ that clearly, kills him. It's not his time yet. So Jesus is in a pickle. I hate pickles. Jesus is in a pickle. He's surrounded by Jews that want to trap him. He's been asked the question that will ultimately lead to his death on a cross. And Jesus won't lie and can't lie. He's sinless and will always tell the truth. So the answer that he gives next is amazing. He gives them an answer that both turns up the heat on their attack and he delivers the truth that they needed to hear and that we need to hear to understand who he is and what he came to do in his mission. What he is about to say is brilliant because it's both an indictment on them and an invitation to them. It brings accusation against them, but it also brings assurance of what's possible for those that believe in Jesus. He answers beautifully, and this is what he says. When they say, tell us plainly, Jesus says this in 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, and you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Church, I want you to see, and God's word wants us to see loud and clear, that Jesus in this answer is confirming boldly that he is the Christ with his word and his works. You ever wondered who Jesus was? You ever maybe thought that he was vague or uncertain or unclear in the message that he was giving and what he said about himself? He's saying the opposite here. He's saying, I am the Christ with my words, but also with my works. And then our big idea, he's saying life comes to those that receive his words and believe his works. I have a pastor friend who just gave this illustration that was super helpful to me. Do you guys ever see Muhammad Ali in that video where he's getting ready for a fight and it's black and white and he's boxing, boxing in the air. Do you know what he says? The champ is here. The champ is here. And he's boxing. The champ is here. He's getting ready for the big fight and he wants you to know who he is and he's saying, the champ is here. When Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I told you and my works bear witness about me, he is declaring boldly, I already said who I was. Everything that I've done up until this point is pointing to it like a sign, loud and clear. The champ is here. The Christ has arrived. That's who I am. Christ isn't A last name, it is a missional title. And he's saying, I've already shown in my mission who I am. 
Christ means Savior, chosen one, God's rescuing king. The entire Old Testament anticipated the arrival of him that would save God's people from their problems and their persecutors, from their sin and their enslavement, from the external enemy crushing them on the outside and the internal enemy corrupting them from the inside. Jesus is saying, when they ask him, just tell us who you are, he's saying, I'm him. I've told you that I'm him, that I'm him, not just only by my words, but also with my works. Verse 25. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. If anybody thinks that Jesus was just a good man or that he's just one of God's messengers or think that we can accept his morals and ideas about social justice and the world without accepting all of him, Jesus is setting the record straight. He's saying, I am who I say that I am. I've told you with my words and I validate it with my works. Now, I want you to see something in John because you might be thinking, well, he hasn't said he's the Christ yet. Has he actually said that he's God? Has that actually happened? Take a peek at this. This is amazing. As we look at the Gospel of John, there are seven I am statements that Jesus makes saying, I've told you who I am. And this is what he said so far. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. And then we'll see in the next few chapters, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly, Jesus is saying, I have because I am. You guys know where that I am comes from? In the Old Testament, with the burning bush and Moses interacting with God, and God tells him to go back to the Egyptians. And Moses says, who should I tell him sent me? And God says, Tell them, I am sent you. When Jesus says, I am the door, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, he's declaring, I am God. And I'm saying it loud and clear. There's no option by which to dissect me. You can't take this and dilute it. You can't make it vague because I'm being crystal clear. And it wasn't just his words that confirmed who he was. It was what he did. That's what he says about the works. He turned water into wine. Nobody done that. He healed an official son that was sick and dying. Nobody done that. He made a paralyzed beggar walk. Nobody done that. He fed 20,000 people with two fish and five loaves. Nobody had done that. He walked on water. Nobody done that. He opened the eyes of a man that was born blind from birth. Nobody's done that. In the next chapter, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Nobody can do that. Only God can do it. And Jesus is saying, the champ is here. I'm him. Jesus said he was the savior of the world and his actions backed it up. His walk confirmed his talk and his talk clarified his walk. He doesn't give us the freedom to detract from his divinity or water down his witness. Is he the Christ? You better believe he is. We can't parse him out. We can't only take the parts that we want because you either get all of them or none of them. I have a dear friend. (laughs) You guys like Costco chickens? I have a dear friend who says she loves Costco chickens. But she says, when I get a Costco chicken, I love that thing. It's so good. I always take the white breast and I take it off and I throw the rest of it away. I love Costco chickens. (laughs) What? Are you kidding me? The best part is where the juices drop under, the meat underneath, and the legs, and the dark meat, and picking it apart, and sucking on all the goodness. You can't say that you love Costco chickens and only take part of the chicken. Leave the rest of the chickens for us. Go to the freezer aisle and get chicken breasts. Don't say you love the whole chicken if you don't. Jesus isn't giving us the option of dividing him and separating him and only taking the parts that we like. I had a shirt as a middle schooler that said, Jesus is my homeboy. That was really popular. Jesus as my homeboy feels great. And everybody had that shirt. It was awesome. But Jesus cannot be your homeboy only. He has to be God of all, Lord reigning and ruling over all creation. And yes, I can call him friend. And if homeboy makes sense to you when you call him friend, call him your homeboy. But he is not your homeboy come to serve you and your purposes. He is God himself. That's who he is. We can't just take Jesus as our co-pilot or as our homeboy or his 
issues and perspective on social justice or his ethics or just his morals. Anytime we take part of Jesus without all of Jesus, we end up with no Jesus. So there's only two responses to him. There's receiving him and rejecting him. And that's what we see in this passage. We see a group that rejects and then we see an invitation to receive because of who he is. He doesn't leave room for the middle. So I'd like to take a peek at the two different responses with you. There's two different responses to what Jesus is saying. First, the response of rejection, which we have to understand and we have to get down to because it's not just the fact that Jesus was vague or uncertain or unclear. Some people reject Jesus and go, I'm just not sure about him. He wasn't clear enough. No, he's crystal clear. The problem lies within. The problem is deeper. I've had dear friends that have come to me and said, if I was just around where Jesus, when Jesus lived, if I just saw the resurrected Christ, if I just witnessed the miracles, I promise you I would follow Jesus. And I say, no, you wouldn't. Why? Because people saw those things and killed him. The problem lies within. The problem is internal. It's not an expectation that he needs to do more. He's done everything. Now it's an internal struggle and something happening under the surface that Jesus invites us into to consider here. It is both uh, accusation and an explanation. Then we have to recognize it. So let's see what he says about the nature of unbelief, those that reject. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. We're going to unpack this in somewhat detail, but we are not going to take the rest of the sermon to unpack this. And I just present to you that this is going to ruffle. Right after this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. (laughs) They didn't like what he was saying. It's hard. It's a hard truth. But it gets at the nature of unbelief, and Jesus wants us to see something. Why don't the Jews believe? Jesus is saying it's because they're not his sheep, this group that he's talking to. Jesus isn't saying, you're not my sheep because you don't believe. He's saying, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. In the gospel, we celebrate faith in Jesus that it saves. Can I get an amen to that? Faith in Jesus saves. It's not your good works. It's not your good deeds. It's not what you bring to the table. It's trust and faith in another. Faith is everything in the Christian life, and yet it's not the first thing. That's important, and Jesus is making it really clear. Something happens in the life of a believer before belief that gives them the ability to believe in the first place. Jesus is saying, you're not my sheep, You're not a part of my flock. If you were, you would believe, but you're not, so you don't believe. Sometimes we think that if there was just more evidence and more miracles and more reliable sources validating the divinity of Jesus, that more would believe. But Jesus is saying the problem is internal. The problem is way before that. The problem of unbelief is much deeper. It's a hardened heart that will not, cannot, and won't turn to God apart from God's intervening work to save it. It's not that I just muster up belief and it's a choice that I make. Actually, it happens before that. That's hard to understand and to grasp and to wrestle with, but Jesus is saying it loud and clear. Look at what else he says in the Gospel of John about this. In John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Jesus is saying that the Father has People, sheep that he gives to the son and all of them come because the father initiates it first. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And they come to Jesus because the father himself draws them to Jesus. God does the initiating work of salvation, not man. John 6, 65, he says it again. For this reason I've said to you, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by the father. This is so difficult to wrap our minds around and the doctrine of predestination and election is beautifully complex and if you're wrestling with this and it's ruffling your feathers, welcome to church because we pray that this would be a place that you can work this out and press into it and grow as we open God's word and we say, wow, God's word teaches God's sovereignty 
and human responsibility, and we are going to wrestle in that. But Jesus is making it really clear here that they can't just stir up faith and belief on their own. Our sin is so great that we can't even will ourselves to believe, but God's grace is so amazing that when he chooses us to believe and causes us to believe, we believe, and nothing can stop that train. Nothing ever, ever. Think about your Christian life. Think about when you became a Christian. I think about that scene in my mind, and sometimes it's hard for me to distinguish. Was it when I was in ninth grade? Maybe. Was it when I was in seventh grade? Maybe. Was it when I was in fourth grade? I don't know. But each time in the moments I think about as a child, me coming and longing for and desiring Jesus, there was a stirring in me that I didn't initiate. There was a longing and a craving and a conviction and a comfort that put me in the tractor beam of heaven and brought me to himself. That's what salvation is. The alternative is that we muster up belief and we come in our own strength and we bring something to the table and God says, I give faith to my sheep and when I give it to them, they're mine. The gospel of Jesus Christ presents us with both design sovereignty and human responsibility. And we see this explanation that they don't believe because the problem's internal. It's an internal rebellion that can only be remedied by initiating love and grace from the Father. That's it. And then on the other side of that, we see the fruit and result of those that God has spoken to and called to himself. It's amazing. And we'll take time to look at those that receive. And I pray that this is a massive encouragement to you who call on the name of Jesus. Verse 27. We just heard about the nature of unbelief and that they don't believe because they're not a sheep. And then 27. Check this. This is amazing. My sheep, Jesus says, hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Before we get to this next slide, if you're taking notes, I want you to underline, underline I and the Father are one. There's a lot of different debate about this, a lot of different world religions that would argue that Jesus never made his divinity clear. He never actually said that he was God. Mormonism argues that. Jehovah's Witness argue that. Islam argues that. Jesus is saying that he's God. Do you guys see that? Am I like crazy? Do I have my crazy goggles on? I don't think so. I and the Father are one, he's saying. The reason that he's able to make the promises he makes and deliver on the things that he says is because he's God himself. Good men and prophets can't do what Jesus says that he was going to do. Only God can. And this is what happens when we hear his voice. His shape are saved by his voice. Check out the slide. What happens? Oh, salvation. We hear Jesus' voice. Obedience. We follow Jesus' invitation and command. Life. We receive eternal life. Promise. We will never perish. Safety. No one can snatch us out of Jesus' hands. And security. No one can separate us from our Father's embrace. When we say Christian here at Gospel Life, that's what we mean. Not good deeds, morality, not trying your best, but that. Christian, identified by Christ, and that's what's possible and secured and delivered to the Christian because of who Jesus is. Salvation. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Have you heard the voice of Jesus calling? He's conviction and he's comfort. He's a sword and he soothes your soul. He tells you you're wrong and then he says that you can be right through him. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. And Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. If you've ever known the voice of the shepherd and responded by faith, you are saved, period, done, amen. That's what it means to be a Christian obedience. We then follow Jesus's commands. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. There are so many options and voices promising life and satisfaction and safety and acceptance in our world today. I had a senior tell me a few years ago at Gospel Life, one of our students, 
I'm just so tired. I don't know who I'm supposed to make happy. Everyone wants me to do something for them, and I don't know which road to go down. She said, everyone expects something from me, and there's too many options to choose from. If I go to college, I'll make my parents happy, but then I'll go in debt. If I start working, I'll make lots of money, but then I'll disappoint my family. If I go to that party, my friends will accept me, but I'll risk my reputation and honoring God. If I have sex with my boyfriend, I'll make him happy, but put my future on the line. Who am I supposed to listen to? Where am I supposed to go? The context of John 10 is important. Do you remember what animal we are? Sheep. We're not that smart. We're not supposed to be. We're terrified. We wander. And Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. That's what it means to be Christian. And they follow me. We're not that smart. We're made to listen to one voice, and it's the voice of our shepherd. No other voice matters. No other perspective. No other advice. No other wisdom. No other command. No other perspective on life, value, success, sexuality, gender, our dreams, our pursuits, our goals. Jesus is the first word, the only word, and the final word. Because in the beginning, Jesus was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus' word is the word because he is the word himself. And his sheep follow his voice. That's what they do. If you've been saved, you follow his voice. Maybe you need reminding of that. Maybe that needs to be stirred up in you again. Do you know that his voice is better than life? Do you know that his pathway, this invitation to trust and follow him, that nothing else compares to it? Everything else is lying to you. Everything else and everyone else is telling you life is found elsewhere. And he says, follow me. Trust me. I'll make your path straight. Salvation, obedience, life. Verse 28, I give them eternal life. And then it's a promise. And then he says, and they will never perish. Rob and I and several others here have had the privilege of doing a few funerals in our pastoral ministry. It's one of the hardest things to do. Because in that moment at a funeral, people are asking and wondering about the most significant question you and I could ever ask. We oftentimes think, well, how do I parent? Well, where should I put my money in my 401k? What house should I buy? That those are significant. At the end, it doesn't matter. You guys know that, right? It doesn't. There's one question that matters, one question that lasts, and it's the question of what happens after we die. There's many different world religions and human philosophies that guess about what happens next. You got lots of options. And maybe on your deathbed, if you aren't a Christian, you will be riddled with the question because you don't know. How could you know? You've never gone there. You've never been on the other side of the afterlife, but there's a lot of different options available to you. Maybe you just cease to exist. Maybe that happens. Maybe you get to a place where you just wander around like a ghost for some reason. Good luck, friends and family. Maybe you get to a place where you're wondering, maybe I'll be reincarnated as a hippo or as a butterfly or as a chair. I don't know. Who knows? Who's supposed to know? All these options have been presented and argued by mere men. But there was a man who showed up on the scene claiming to be God, the only one existing outside of time and space, who's seen afterwards. And when he says, I give them eternal life, he is able to say that because he's the only one that knows. He's the only one. So either he is the Christ and God or he isn't. And if you say that he is the Christ and God and you've heard his voice and followed him, you can have confidence that because of Jesus, you have eternal life and you will never perish. That's the best news. A few weeks ago, I was um, expressing how oftentimes in the Christian life, we can think that it's just about heaven and miss the promise of abundant life today. That's true. But did you know that if you're a Christian, eternal life starts now? Now, this is the worst that it's going to get for you. That's incredible that only going forward, you have the promise of life. Death will not snatch you out of his hands. Nothing can get in the way of that. Do you have that confidence for your deathbed? I've had the privilege of sitting with a few on their deathbed in the final moments, Christians. And I'm telling you, It's one of the most profound and beautiful things to look at a mother-in-law or look at Monica March or to be with my granddad and to hear rest and peace and assurance. It's not what they've done. It's not anything they bring to the table, but it's their trust in what Jesus has done for them. 
My sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And then it gets even better. And no one can snatch them out of my hands. My father who is greater than all is greater than everybody and no one can snatch him out of my father's hands. There is safety and security in being a Christian because you are safely held by Christ. I wonder why Jesus says the double there. He says the same thing twice. Did you see that? I give them eternal life. They'll never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's a big deal. I love that. But what happens after Jesus left? I oftentimes think that if Jesus was here on earth and was just my pal every day holding me in a snuggie, that I would believe the promises of the gospel. Like, he's here. He's with me. I see it. Okay, I got it. Okay, I forgot. Thank you for reminding me. Thanks for the snuggle. We're good. He's saying that, if believe me, no one can snatch them out of my hands. But my Father, who's greater than all, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. If you had any doubt... I and the Father are one, and we're saying the exact same thing. You are safe, Christian. You're secure. Have you ever questioned your salvation? Okay, a few of you are looking at me like, should we answer? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> yeah! Can't tell you how many times I've wondered after I failed, am I still saved? After I don't feel saved and I feel like my emotions are like a roller coaster, I question my salvation. When my doubts and my questions get louder than my confidence, I question it. That's such a confusing thing in the Christian life because our feelings are telling us one thing and yet we're wondering, am I still saved? I know there are people here asking that. I know that. What Jesus is saying is incredibly significant because he's saying he is the seatbelt for the roller coaster of the life that you're going to experience. My son at the fair, you guys went to the fair? Anybody go to Sillyville? Sillyville, it's usually pretty silly. This is not silly. This was crazy. I was in Sillyville with my son, and he wanted to go on a roller coaster. It's the tiger roller coaster, the black and white one that goes around in circles, and it's got a tiger face on it. He really wanted to do it, and he's two and a half. He did one roller coaster before that, kind of a gentle one, and he saw that one, and he goes, coaster, and he just walks towards it, and he gets in line and just barely goes over the little height limitation, like kind of had to get on his tiptoes to allow the guy to let him on. And he gets on the roller coaster, and I'm watching him, and he's sitting next to his sister, and the bar comes down to keep him in place and locks. The tricky thing is it hit Maggie's legs, who's four and a half, and Graham, who's two and a half, was just hanging out underneath of it. He didn't really feel that it was secure, didn't feel super confident, but he didn't care. He was on a tiger roller coaster. Thing starts going. The second it starts, it's a jolting start. His hands weren't on the bar. He wasn't holding on. He didn't know what to do, and his face, boom, nails the rail. Nails it from like the, the second it started. And he just, just like, ah, what happened? But the ride just started, man. So the thing starts going around in circles. And slowly over this ride, he's sinking into like his seat. And I'm watching, thinking it might be the end. I don't know. Maggie is supposed to be protecting him. She doesn't care. She's having the time of her life with her hands up. And I'm literally watching Graham in the corner like this. And he's like looking like he's going to slip out. But even though he wasn't holding on, even though it didn't feel like the bar was keeping him, that bar kept him for the entire ride. That's our Savior, guys. That's this promise. No one will snatch you from my hand. No one can take you from the Father's hand. This Christian life will be a roller coaster of emotion, and you'll feel like a crazy person. And yet, when you're saved, it's done, signed, sealed, delivered, you're secure. The king, the Christ, the champ is here, and he's the one who makes it possible. That's what salvation means. When we say Christian, that's what we mean, because that's what salvation actually is. Yeah, amen is right. If you are a Christian, you are saved. You are safe. You are secure. You are called to follow Jesus, and guess what? Ezekiel says that he removes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh and gives us his spirit to move us to follow his commands and decrees. If you've ever wondered, I don't feel like I have the strength to follow, the Holy Spirit's been given to you to follow. You've been given the promise of eternal life. It's yours in that final moment on your deathbed. You can rest. You are safe and secure in Christ forever starting today. 
This is your assurance. This is your confidence. And this is the best news that you and I could ever hear. Now, this is given for Christians. Now, you might be wondering, we're talking about two different audiences. Those that receive, that's what is made true and promised and guaranteed for those that receive. What about those that don't? You just said earlier that they don't receive because they're not his sheep. That doesn't seem fair. Is Jesus just going to be over here now, being with only his sheep, saying, I'm just going to talk to my sheep now because they're not my sheep, and I'm turning my back in this amazing doctrine of predestination and election. How does this work out with Jesus' interaction with the unbeliever? He answers it here, and it's incredible. And this is where he ends his dialogue. This is how it ends, verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. They didn't kill Jesus for turning water into wine or healing people. They killed him because he claimed to be God. Then verse 34 to 36, we're not going to unpack this for the sake of time, but the argument here, Jesus basically enters himself into the law and uses an argument in the law to condemn them. He's saying, is it not written in your law? I said that you are gods and you guys accept that. I say I'm God and you want to kill me. What's the deal? He's using something from Psalm 82, seven to flip their logic on its tail and to condemn them and to say, you got no logical reason or internal reason to reject me. So we're not gonna get into that. He's basically flipping logic to condemn them. And it's really interesting the way that he does it. But what matters for our purposes is verse 37. This is what he says to these people that he says aren't his sheep, that aren't believing because of an internal problem of internal rejection and rebellion that they're responsible for. 37, if I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. Our big idea was life comes to those that receive Jesus' words and believe Jesus' works. The Christian has received life if they've listened to Jesus' words and examined his work. But Jesus is giving an invitation to to the unbeliever to look to his works, to consider what he's done, and have that be presented to them as the basis for the decision that they make. He still gives the non-sheep an invitation to believe, and that's incredible, that they might come to know him. He says, if I'm not doing the works of my father, don't believe me, but look to my works. You might have rejected my words. Take a second look at my works. It's really interesting in Revelation. At the very end, it says that believers overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The evidence and declaration of changed lives. Jesus started building up this credibility of his testimony in the signs that he performs in the Gospels. Every sign that he did, every miracle that he performed was a massive banner pointing to the fact that he was the Messiah. And Jesus, in his compassion, is saying, look to the works. You're not listening to my words. Look to the works. Would you consider those? Take a second look. It's loud and clear. And it's with that invitation that we invite you, if you're on the fence about Jesus, take a second look at the works. What do you do with what Jesus did? I was talking to a saint, a beloved member here at Gospel Life, right after the first service, and she came up to me and said, man, my son, he's struggling, he's running in a lifestyle apart from God, and I want him to hear that what I'm saying to him is Jesus' words, not my words. And not just that, but I want him to consider our life. It's been changed by Jesus. We've been transformed. And I want him to get a front seat to Jesus changing us. And maybe that's the testimony that God might use to change his heart, to stir him, to turn him, to invite him to hear the words of Jesus. You might have heard the Bible before. You might have heard the words of Jesus before. You might have heard arguments from believers about why they believe and why they think the Bible is true, but maybe you're just like, it's not for me. It's just words. It doesn't do anything. To you, I want to make this request. Take a second look at the works of Jesus. What do you do with them? Where do you go with them? 
You might say, oh man, I, I don't know. There's, uh, it's really only an internal book. There's a lot of evidence of Jesus in the Bible, but there's not a whole lot outside. How am I supposed to examine what Jesus did from a biased book? I want you to take a peek at this. A man by the name of Josephus, he was a historian, a Roman historian that lived in the first century. He was four years old living in Jerusalem when Jesus died. He was there in Jerusalem as a four-year-old. And after that, he became a historian of both Jewish history and Roman history. And he is the most widely accepted historian of the first century for Roman history and for Jewish history. He wrote a book called The Antiquities, and he wrote this. A Jew who we don't believe was a Christian, but was wrestling and considering and struggling. We don't know his story, but this is what he said. External evidence about this Jesus we're talking about. He said this. Now there was about this time a wise man, Jesus, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men who received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to himself both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was indeed perhaps the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. Life comes to those that receive Jesus' words and believe Jesus' works. Listen to his words and receive them. Examine his works, believe them. If you're a Christian, you are safe, you're secure, you're eternally held by the promises of God. And if you're wondering about Jesus, take a second look at him. We implore you, we beg you. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it's the greatest news you could ever hear. I'm gonna pray for us and we'll invite you to the communion table. I pray that you take this, wrestle with it, apply it, talk about it. Let's pray as we get ready to respond. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son and thank you for salvation. Lord, if we are numb to that as believers, if we've grown cold to it, Lord, would you wake us up to how good your good news really is. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. As I look to Jesus, as we look to Jesus, everything else pales in comparison and sinks away when we realize how sure a salvation we have because we have a sure and steadfast Savior. You are the Christ. You are God. When you save, it's done, and we have that by faith. And for those that don't yet know you, would they wrestle? Would they consider? And would you turn their heart with your word even today? And would they place their trust in you for the forgiveness of sin and the hope of life with you forever? In Jesus' name, amen.